everybody how are you doing today i hope you're having a good one things are looking beautiful for me so um today we're going to talk about uh, part two of steve framble actually talking about the difference between the aptera company in 2008 to what they are doing now so let's get started <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back to my channel. It's good to have you here. Everybody looking forward to Aptera coming out with this baby. And so here's some of the things that we can look at. Um, here, Steve Framble is talking about some of the lessons that he learned from when he first formed the company and what they went through and actually how it is much better today. So um, let, let's listen in. In 2008, you hired Paul Wilbur as CEO and stepped into the role of CTO. And only a year later in 2009, you and Chris left the company entirely. And two years after that, Aptera was liquidated. So I guess my three questions, which are all kind of related, is what happened exactly? What did you learn from the experience? And how are those lessons being incorporated into the Aptera we know today? Well, what happened was, uh, yes, our board encouraged us to bring in what they called professional management from automotive and somewhat in their defense, you know, again, new segment, new product, new industry. All of us are wondering how do we go and raise big money, you know, without having someone with automotive experience, at least on the management team. And uh, of course, this being my first startup and Chris's second startup and the amount of money that we are looking to raise, I suppose maybe we didn't as founders exude a lot of confidence with the early board that we could do this. And I think we had a lot of self-doubt as well. I think we were on board getting a professional CEO who had automotive experience. And it was pitched to us as sort of like, you know, the Eric Schmidt coming in to work with Larry and Sergey. And that was what was pitched to us. And that's what we had, were expecting. But we were completely unprepared for the sort of Machiavellian evolution of the power structure and dynamics and I've since come to learn this is sort of the standard fare, you know, with at the time companies like Chrysler or other automotive companies, you know, it's a very cutthroat, you know, stab your way to the top, climb the ladder, however you can kind of business. It isn't how Chris and I work or deal with things, but I suppose it is a reality, you know, of the world. That's just how the world is. And so I'd say from the beginning, the relationship just didn't work well. You know, we later found out they were not very complimentary or not even, I was supposed trying to help us or support us, you know, with the board, they were maybe a um, professional team had some plans all along, but it became clear. We just couldn't work together. There wasn't mutual trust. There wasn't respect. And most importantly, they were unable to raise money. So Chris and I had raised all the money at that point. So after a year of this, you know, Chris and I decided that they had to go and uh, we made our case. We built consensus with the board, uh, but when it came down to the board vote and the fight, if you will, we were outvoted by one. And so we left the company and parted our ways. So that's kind of the short story of what happened. I went and started a vertical farming company because I, I love food uh, and I love growing things and I didn't want to use pesticides or herbicides. And so I, I got my first term sheet in a month after I left Aptera and uh, started FamGrow, and Chris started Flux Power, which at the time was, I think, one of the first sort of aftermarket or industrial BMS battery systems that one could buy for lithium. But I would say that we did not align well with the team. There was lots of friction. I think we tried. I, maybe there's always stuff we could do better, but they were trying to run it like a billion-dollar company, and they were spending like it was a billion-dollar company, and they weren't able to raise any money. And so... That was why we precipitated that fight and we lost and that's why we left. I think sharing that is really vital, actually, because even myself who followed Aptera back in the day, when it went under at the time, I was like, oh, I guess 
I guess it just failed, right? Like I didn't know the backstory behind it. But the way that you're framing it makes it more in line and more of a piece with, <laughs> let's use the most classic example, Apple. Uh, you have a visionary founder who is convinced by the board to bring in a more traditionally minded CEO, John Scully, the former CEO of Pepsi. And then exactly two years after Scully was brought on, Jobs was out, right? And again, anyone who back then probably wasn't familiar with the inner workings of Apple might think, oh, well, Jobs must have been, you know, he couldn't cut it. And then watching a floundering Apple over the next couple of decades, I guess just Apple is not a good company. But I think what that shows and what your story shows and putting it in the context of the reformation and the refounding of Aptera today is that oftentimes, like, if the vision and the leadership aren't really aligned and they don't really know the product they're trying to sell and the product they're trying to make, you can have a really fantastic product and it won't get off the ground. And it sounds like that's what happened with the first iteration of Aptera. That's right. You have to believe in it. You have to at least make an attempt. And these guys and gals, it's just, it's not something that they believed in. It wasn't important to them. I think it was a job where they could make maybe a mark. And I think professionally, they wanted to do that. They did want to make a mark. And maybe in their mind, I think they were doing the right thing. But, you know, none of them drove hybrids. Of course, there's no electric vehicles to drive at the time, but most of us did. And, you know, we tinkered with electric vehicles scooters, bicycles, cars, et cetera. You know, there was this um, sort of ecosystem of hobbyist and lay knowledge in going in that field, you know, that we had developed. And the team from Detroit just really had no interest in inserting themselves into that. And the way I describe it, that kind of thinking and skill set, you know, from Detroit, this sort of professional automotive design management, et cetera. You know, we've got real automotive engineers that either work with us now or, or work, uh, they're from different companies, you know, all over the world. And they do incredible work and you need that. But do you need that mentality driving at the top, like the kind of leadership that you have at GM or, you know, Stellantis or something like that? I, I don't think so. I think you move too slow. You're thinking about things in ways that aren't really reflective of the unique segment that you're in or that you're creating. And too often than not, you can really only go back to your old playbook. And I think it's just one of the common things that even today we look for with managers come from other industries. You know, we have to make sure that they're open-minded enough to jettison thinking that may not be appropriate. And it's very difficult for professionals to do after 40 or 50 years old. It's why larger companies are so vulnerable to disruption, right? I think I've talked about this on the podcast at some point before, but like only Apple could have made the iPhone because at the time they were kind of failing with the Mac. Microsoft was trying to make a smartphone that was basically a miniaturized Windows 95 because that was their strength. And they wanted to build on that strength, not realizing that trying to make a desktop into a tiny little phone was the absolutely wrong way to go about it. It was only Apple being small, nimble, failing pretty much at the main industry they wanted to crack into that could think from a first principles perspective, what's going to make the best smartphone rather than how can we fit a desktop into a, a smartphone casing? But to something you said earlier, Stephen, I so relate to it because I think it happens in every single industry. I certainly experience this on film sets and in advertising. But when I was working in independent film and trying to get like something I'd written off the ground, I realized very quickly that you can be working with incredibly talented, capable, genuinely fantastic, wholesome, wonderful human beings, people that I am friends with to this day. I realized that getting other people as passionate about what you are passionate about is one of the hardest things to do. Because the thing that is driving you every day, the thing that caused you to leave Illumina, the thing that would cause me to try and start a script from scratch and then try and get all the funds together and, and make something, right? Like that burning ember in your chest that keeps you up at night that you have to try and go for it, right? That thing is so unique that trying to communicate that or spread that to other people is so hard. And I imagine that even in this iteration, in the 2019 iteration of Aptera, like you were saying earlier, getting people on board with that vision, finding that right team that's either just as passionate or nearly as passionate as you and Chris are, is probably one of the hardest things about forming or reforming a company. To some degree, let me explain. We're really, really lucky. I think in most businesses, that is absolutely the case. Most of America, right, is built and operated by companies that do all kinds of innocuous things, you know, from building widgets or shipping boxes or making machines that, uh, you know, palletize stuff. And these are all 
critical things for families to have food and for people to have income and for the economy to flow, like all kinds of critical jobs that are just, they're just not exciting, but they're critical and they're necessary. In our case, it's like we've built something that serves as this lantern or spotlight that's very far away that shows people the way and it draws people to it. And it does that for us. The vehicle almost creates that passion and interest for us. It's self-selecting. The people that come to us are already of that nature because they've seen the product and they know where we're going and they know what we're trying to do. And it self-selects for those kinds of people. You know, it wasn't that way with my last company, with FamGrow and Vertical Farming. Yes, you have people who are interested in that, interested in agriculture, interested in feeding the world. But it's just on a whole different level with Aptera. And then you add on top of it the work that Quincy here and then Sarah Hardwick are doing to spread this message socially and just to see how this builds up momentum on its own. It's unlike anything I've ever experienced or would have planned for. And I think it starts with the product. And that is what is doing a lot of the inspiration. It's less about Chris and I, you know, needing to speak to inspire people. The product is doing that. That's very well said. Because again, when I've been telling folks about this conversation we're having, most of them, the lay person who's maybe not hyper-focused on the EV market, hadn't heard of Aptera, right? But then I start describing it, or I show them a photo. And I said earlier, and I hope folks have now looked up some images of the vehicle, it has this teardrop shape, but it really is like an exclamation point in terms of when you see it, <laughs> you can't help but think like, what is that? It looks dynamic. It looks not to, uh, to build up your ego too much, Steve, but it does look revolutionary in terms of its design. And I think kind of similar to how there's a very specific type of person who's going to go and work for SpaceX. Elon's like, I want to get to Mars. You know, there are going to be people who say, I want to do that too. I can understand how the mission of Aptera, the design of the vehicle, what you're trying to accomplish is going to be, like you were saying, the lighthouse, the magnet that pulls people in. That totally makes sense to me. The other component is that nature abhors inefficiency. So we've evolved, every animal and plant has evolved to be incredibly efficient from where it was. You know, plants shut off different mechanisms that consume energy in different states of their existence. Humans do the same. We pattern match to save energy. You know, the brain is the largest energy consuming organ in the body. And so evolutionarily speaking, it wouldn't make sense for us to analyze, let's say, a car, when we look at a car, we say, you know, boxy object, it's rectangular, it's steel, has four corners with rubber things. Oh, this must be a car. Instead, we just pattern match. We learn what a car is, and that uses less energy. And so when people see things that are sort of within what nature intended, whether it's the shape of a bird or the way a leaf looks or something like this, it looks natural and you expect it. It resonates with you because it's part of nature. And all we've done is just look to nature and create something that is very efficient in the way nature would. And I think people, because of that, they just instinctively infer when they look at it that this is something that is, it's natural, it's efficient, it's not wasteful. And they can just tell without us having to say a word. I want to ask a variation of a question I, I asked earlier around motivation and inciting incident. Because like we've mentioned in 2019, you and Chris relaunched Aptera Motors and are planning to begin production on your first electric vehicle, the simply named Aptera, in 2023. So what brought you back? What was it about this moment and this market that makes it the moment and the market for Aptera Motors? Why now? After the dissolution of Aptera, I had stopped thinking about electric vehicle startup, anything related to that space ever again. I just put it out of my mind. And I don't know that Chris ever did. And it was maybe two years after we moved back from the Middle East, my, my family and I, I went over there as part of my work in ag tech. We were talking with a friend of ours, actually um, our former lobbyist who helped us pass, they called the Aptera law, you know, making a three-wheel vehicle able to be qualified for Department of Energy loans. None of us had really lost contact over the years. And so we had a lunch, I think it was in San Clemente. And, you know, we were just talking about the state of the industry and how there's really only one company that's dominating the industry, and that was Tesla. And range seemed to be the factor that was driving the sales range of the vehicle. 
and that with the hyper-efficient shape like Aptera and with the new energy density of, of cells, we could pack 100 kilowatt hours of cells in that vehicle and make something that could go 1,000 miles. And so then we could dominate the range segment. And that just got us talking again and having the conversation. And I think it was me as the electrical engineer. Of course, I went to MATLAB. I started doing some simulations and updating the model that I'd had from 10 years ago. And we determined that, yeah, you know, we could make a very affordable 200, 400, 600 mile electric vehicle that would even a thousand miles because it uses such fewer cells because of its efficiency, you'd be able to go to the same range for a lot less money. And we thought that there was value in that. And we wrote a business plan and restarted the company. We also had a chance at the time to reacquire some of the IP that was available and immediately started creating new IP regarding solar structures, composites, cooling, et cetera. It was, I think, realizing that there was no one in the EV market with range being one of the single biggest customer considerations. The thesis that had been presented by the industry was, well, we're going to address range by making the vehicles bigger and shoving more batteries in it. And we just thought that was the wrong direction. We have to use fewer batteries to go further. And we want to use fewer batteries to go further because that's less mining, that's less resources, that's less labor, that's less cost for the customer. So we wanted to figure out how to do more with less because the current direction we didn't think would be sustainable without large incentives, or they would only be available for the really wealthy. And we thought that for EVs to have an impact, they need to be available for everybody. And with the starting price point of 25900 it's a lot more attainable than most other EVs on the market. Steve, we are so glad you and Chris came back and started at Terra again. We know that you're looking out for the planet Earth and for us lowly people who can't afford these high-end vehicles that they're coming out with. Um, we really appreciate all that you and everybody at Aptera are doing. Uh, now we're going to look at what's happening on the Accelerator program. And we want to keep our eye on that, knowing that this is really going to kick us off. And so here we see, okay, there's 394, okay, investors. All right, they still coming in. Now we're at 5.56 million. Yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Hey, we see um, they are not in order here. So this has actually been changed a little bit. You got number 20, GE is number 20 out of Texas. Um, <clears throat> so RP is still number one. Um, they just switched the numbers around a little bit. I don't know why they did that, but here at number six is PG. Um, so PG was, um, actually number five the last time I checked. So somebody knocked him down a little bit. But uh, anyway, everybody on this board here is really in an outstanding position. And we really love you guys. You, you guys are awesome. So everybody, I know that this is really going to start taking off when we get closer to the end of March. And so if you want to get in on this, go ahead and... You know, you could go ahead and uh, invest $10,000 and get on board to getting your Aptera. Or if you just want to uh, sign in the regular way, you can actually go to the website and um, order the Aptera you want. And you can use my link right here. This will take $30 off the down payment. So all you have to do is put $70 down. And yes, Aptera is going to be ready to rock and roll here pretty soon. We see they're slowly getting everything together. And I am so excited about Aptera. These boys are on a hot roll. So yes, indeed, go ahead and make sure you get in on this um, project that they're coming out with, the Aptera. And remember, I'm not a financial advisor, so talk to your advisor before you invest anything because this does come with some risk. But if you want to buy one, then, you know, it's a money back guarantee. Whatever you put down, you can get back if they don't succeed. All right, so now I'm gonna give a shout out to my patrons. You guys are awesome. Oh, and if you're new here, go ahead, 
Hit the like, ring the bell, and subscribe. You'll catch all my new videos when they come out. And of course, you know, I'm going to keep you up to date. And we're going to keep at Terry on our minds and keep, keep this baby rolling. All right, y'all take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. You have a good one. Goodbye.